Hello, I'm Gail Whiffen Coyle, the Associate Editor at French Journal, and today we're doing an author chat with one of the January issue authors, Emily Wurzba. Hey, Emily. Hello. And she is in the January issue on climate change, um, and her article, along with Jose Aguto, is called Affirming the Heart of Climate Advocacy, and it's on page 18 in the issue. So, um, Jose couldn't join us today, but we have Emily to speak with, and they both work at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Jose is the Legislative Secretary, and Emily is the Policy Assistant for FCNL's um, Sustainable Energy and Environment Program. And Emily is joining me today from the FCNL office in Washington, D.C. So um, this article starts out with a group of students from Yardley Meeting in Pennsylvania, and they're meeting with Representative Mike Fitzpatrick, who is a Republican from Pennsylvania as well. And they meet to discuss climate change and how it affects the younger generation. Um, how did this meeting come about? How did this happen? And, and what was FCNL's involvement? Yeah, so student groups from Quaker schools and Quaker meetings uh, often come by the office to either get a tour of our uh, LEED certified building or to learn about the programs that we're doing. And so I was contacted by Jenna, who was the, the middle school Sunday school teacher at the, at the meeting, and asked if um, she could bring a group of students to learn about climate change and then actually go meet with their representatives. So I've done some work with other middle school and high school groups uh, doing lobbying work and I think she had she knew that and so wanted to give their students an opportunity. So then we set up the meeting and helped to get the lobby visit scheduled and the training. That's great. So this is something that other, you know, Quaker meetings and, and Quaker schools could reach out to FCNL about? Um, yeah, dep depending on the situation and the schedule, um, we have a big spring lobby weekend every March. So this year, March 14th to 17th, we're going to have hopefully 250 young adults and students come to D.C. to lobby on climate change. So that's our big focus for kind of the spring. But there'll be a few other schools that bring a, a group of students um, this year. Wonderful. So you work within FCNL's Sustainable Energy and Environment Program. Mm -hmm. um, could you just explain a little bit about that program and, and your goals? Sure. So our program is, the, the end goal is uh, one of FCNL's uh, four We Seeks, uh, the We Seek and Earth Restored. So that's what our program is designed to do. Uh, and we work on a variety of environmental issues that come up in federal legislation in Congress. But our, our primary uh, program effort right now is what we call the call to conscience on climate disruption. So we, um, if we look at what's happening around the world with climate change, um, in order to really see the, the changes that we need, um, we need this international binding uh, treaty. But we can't really get there because the U.S. and other countries aren't willing to make those agreements. And so when we look at the U.S., it's, it's really Congress that's preventing the U.S. from moving forward on climate action. So we've really kind of narrowed it down to how do we get there to be bipartisan action in Congress on climate change? Because until we have that, it'll be really difficult to pass meaningful and viable climate legislation like a price on carbon um, and other, other mitigation efforts. So if our goal is to kind of get this bipartisan acknowledgement that climate change is, is happening, it's, it's human induced and is already occurring, um, that we have to accept the science. So we, our, our effort is to uh, help uh, put together interfaith delegations and help um, people of faith and other community members across the country uh, raise their voice in a, in a moral and faith message and, and ask their legislators questions like, you know, what is the world that you wish to leave to your grandchildren? And, and what's, the you know, what's the legacy you wish to leave on this issue? What does your heart tell you? So really trying to connect at a heart level, um, taking it out of the partisan and political sphere, uh, because once... Once we have, we, we use the, the tenant from Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you have to admit a, a problem before you can solve it. So that's kind of our goal. And so our, our main legislative goal for this year is to get a bipartisan congressional resolution in Congress that just states the science of climate change and commits to some kind of legislative action, although we don't expect this resolution will suggest the right path forward. So just get, and, that, get that conversation going. Yeah, yeah. And I and as you were speaking, I remembered from um, the article that you say, U.S. passage of that treaty requires approval of um, 67 
senators. So that's that's the number um, representing both parties. So mm -hmm. that's that's yeah. what you're shooting for. Yeah, and we, we look at Congress and the makeup of the Senate, and you know we don't see in any time in the near future there'll be 67. You know, Democrats. We're, we're a nonpartisan organization. We need both parties mm -hmm. to be able to work on this together. Yeah. So, what what's the latest with Representative Fitzpatrick and um, like his position on climate change? I was just looking at his Twitter feed this morning because we were tweeting at him yesterday, mm -hmm. and we didn't get a response from him. But um, I do see that he's doing some environmental work. Um, one of the most recent things was an, an Arctic wilderness bill that that mm -hmm. I think he co-sponsored but are there any other updates about him and then the the bill that he agreed to co-sign after meeting with the the Yardley meeting students yeah so he announced after he won his re-election that this will be his last term in Congress so we and that could be an opportunity to get him to really uh, take a take a stronger stance on climate action um, there, you know, the Congress just got back, so it'll be interesting to see how his how he votes the next few months. Um, he's one of the Repu few Republicans in the House that has voted on a series of green votes this year. So the League of Conservation Voters has a, a score that you can look up to see what percentage of their votes were the green or climate friendly vote. And he he has one of the highest scores for 2014 for Republicans. Um, so yeah, so I think he will. We're going to continue to try to encourage him to take stronger climate action. Um, I know the, the PREPARE Act, the bill that he co-sponsored, it had, by the end of the year, it had five Republican co-sponsors and 11 Democrat co-sponsors. Um, the bill, I don't think, has been reintroduced yet this Congress, but we're going to be working with uh, the lead sponsors of that bill to, to figure that out and continue to support all sorts of bipartisan legislation that's, that's climate related. Okay, great. Um, so I want to end with a quote from the article that really stuck out to me, mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to read it. Uh, okay. This dark time is an opportunity to practice our faith in democracy like never before. We must remember that politicians don't create pre political will, but respond to it. So to me, the first part can be viewed almost in two different ways. Um, when I was going back and reading the article, uh, one way of looking at it is more about getting the Quaker voice out there on Capitol Hill, getting it heard, um, and that would be like practicing our faith in a political context. And then another way of looking at it, um, this practicing our faith in democracy, is about having faith in democracy and our government and how the system works and how individuals are you know, vested with the power to influence legislators. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how do you interpret it as as one of the authors of the article? De definitely both ways. I think yeah. you're you're absolutely right that um, it's so important that Quakers across the country make that connection, and and so many have done such a wonderful job about this. I mean, our our work is comes from our network of Quakers across the country. That's where our success comes from. But but recognizing that. Um, that the faith voice and speaking from a place of faith is so important and really has this really unique role to play in Congress right now because that's a uniquely nonpartisan voice that can, you know, speaking to another member of Congress's faith. So even if you uh, disagree with their stance, you, you, where is the, that of God in them? How do you connect with them? And it's really that place of faith that allows you to do it. So, on, so that's very important. And then to the second way of interpreting that phrase, um, we have to not give up on democracy. And I know, you know, especially the, this new Congress is more partisan and good luck than ever, but that's, this is when our voice matters more than ever. And, you know, we always say you can get frustrated and overwhelmed and just give up, but to, to remain silent is to kind of endorse inaction. And so really continually um, contacting your members of Congress and not giving up that your voice matters and that if they're not hearing from you, they're not going to be held accountable to that action that you wish them to take. So uh, it's it's so important uh, to not give up and to remember that your voice matters. And that's those grassroots lobby visits or contacts with a member really are what changed their minds more than anything else. And so it's, it's really important not to forget that. Yeah. And, and you were actually speaking to the second part of that quote um, that 
politicians don't create the political will but respond to it. And I feel like that, when I read that, I was like, oh, yeah, that is so important <laughs> to remember. Yeah. And I'm sure FCNL is saying that point over and over again to their supporters and, and <laughs> pushing for that empowerment. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, we look at what's happening in the next two years on climate change, and, and we don't believe that a viable presidential candidate from either party in 2016 will be able to ignore climate change. And so how do we how do we get there? And we I really see a lot of room for progress in the next two years. There, there are numerous bipartisan environmental bills um, that were that will hopefully be reintroduced soon. I think there was a new Yale opinion poll released this week that said over 50% of Republicans think that carbon dioxide should be regulated as a pollutant. So I think public opinion is shifting on this. I think Congress is going to have to shift on this. And so really putting your voice in action is what's, what's going to make that happen. Great. Well, that's all the time that we have today. Um, thank you so much for joining with me today. And you can read Emily and Jose's article in the January issue on climate change. Um, and F Emily joins us from FCNL. And we'll put a link to, to FCNL's website if people want to go learn more about um, what the organization does and specifically more about the Sustainable Energy and Environment Program. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.